The God that you, the God that I serve, is a God of deliverance. And we could never, ever put any limitations on God's delivering power in our life. We're going, to do, we're going to begin to explore that in much more detail here in just a couple of minutes, and I believe it's going to help you in a tremendous way. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the extremely important biblical item, discovering and understanding that God is a God of deliverance. And you would probably say, well, well, yeah, we, we, we know that when we're... We're Christians, so we know that our God is a God of deliverance, and that is true, but sometimes what we can do, we can, we can uh, almost unconsciously uh, put limitations on the delivering scope, the delivering reach of God's, deli- of God's uh, power in our life. And that's what this is all about, is just reminding us, reminding us like every day that we need to understand, even throughout a given day, especially what we go through in seasons of life, that God's delivering power has not uh, become uh, extinct in our life. God's God's delivering power has not uh, become far off, that it doesn't occur anymore. That's what the enemy wants us to believe, but we know that God is always endeavoring to deliver his people. I've used this scripture as far as this kind of our text to start us out, and I'm going to go back to that. It's in uh, Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78, verses 40 through 42, been focusing on those scriptures to get us going. Uh, remember, that's a histor- historical account of the children of Israel wandering in the, w- in the wilderness uh, dur- during that 40 year span from the time they uh, had the phenomenal miracle of deliverance of the part of the Red Sea and to, the, to where they eventually came to the east bank of the Jordan River and cross over, which we have recorded in the book of Joshua. So this, the, the psalmist, of course, uh, on a millennial later, give or take a couple hundred years, uh, the psalmist looks back and just begins to rehearse this history on, on what caused the people of God to um, actually not experience the full power of God in their life. Notice this, uh, Psalm chapter 7, 8, verse 40, it says, How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, verse 40, especially the second stanza, this is what we're focusing on. When it says, they remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. So they forgot the hand of the Lord. And we looked at that in detail over the, over the previous couple of weeks. Now we're focusing on this stanza of scripture. And that again is, they forgot when God delivered them from the enemy. And some uh, versions read actually more closely to the literal translation, uh, they forgot when the Lord delivered them from affliction. And I brought this out already, but it bears repeating. That particular phrase in Psalm 78, verse 42, about them forgetting uh, that God delivered them from the enemy, from their affliction, it initially means when he parted the Red Sea and completely caused their enemy to be in their past, is that, you know, the account, we looked at that uh, more fully a few weeks ago again, is that once they crossed the Red Sea, the entire Egyptian army uh, was in the midst of the Red Sea and God collapsed the waters of the Red Sea and they were all drowned. And whereas God's people were on the opposite side of the Red Sea, they rejoiced, you have that in uh, Exodus chapter 15, and they begin to declare that God delivered them from the horse and the rider, uh, throwing them into the sea, that God performed a phenomenal, phenomenal miracle of deliverance in, in their lives. The entirety, of anywhere, bare minimum, three and a half plus million people. Some scholars say up to six plus million people of God that were brought out of Egyptian bondage. So bottom line, you had millions and millions of people, God's people, God's Old Testament covenant people, that they were completely delivered by one swift act of God, one given day. So that's what the psalmist is initially referring to. And also in conjunction with that, he just categorizes this and using the word also in some versions, which is very accurate to the literal translation, that is the word affliction. So that, so that saying God's people, can you believe this? God's people, after all he did for them, they forgot that he delivered them from their affliction. He, they forgot that he delivered them from the enemy that one given day, the Red Sea 
miracle, deliverance, and also even after that. Because afflictions always come from the enemy. Always remember that. Never, ever forget that. It's like Christianity 101. Here's Christianity 101. That God is a good God. The devil's a bad devil. Simple as that. Now from there, when you begin to extrapolate out those given categories, it gets, it gets very, very deep in many regards. And uh, it takes a lifetime to fully understand the complexities, the, uh, uh, can I say, the, the, the almost, almost the fathomless degree of understanding how good God is, infinitely good God is, and how vehemently diabolical Satan is. But anyway, Christianity 101. So God is always for you. He's not against you. So afflictions come from the enemy. I, I said all that to say that. Come back to that point. Afflictions come from the enemy. Remember this, the book of Psalm uh, chapter 34 declares that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord deliver them out of them all. So afflictions are going to come and go. Now, one thing you can't do when you read that scripture, you can't push pause. You can't get into just the, the, fore, the forefront of it and push pause of that scripture. There again, Psalm 34 that declares many are the afflictions of the righteous. Don't, pause, don't push pause there. Don't stop there. You got to keep going through that scripture to read it and then absorb the latter part of it, which is extremely, extremely faith filled. There's a lot of people that study the book of Job and they either don't read the end of it or they forget what happens at the end or they've never read the book of James that even says consider the latter end of Job. So yeah, Job went through hell and high water, most difficult, difficult uh, experiences in any one person's life with the loss of his children. I mean, his health, his finances, his name, everything wiped out, completely wiped out. So-called friends turning on him. And uh, anyway, he had multitudes of friends when it came down to it. He had, he had well, supposedly about four of them, and even they, of course, were judging him. So he's all alone going through this, by and large, and uh, but some people forget that the Lord delivered him out of that eventually, that the Lord blessed him, that the end of Job was greater than what he had ever experienced before the calamity, before the loss, before the heartache, before the relational, uh, emotional, uh, physical, financial trauma occurred in his life. So the, the latter end of Job was so much greater because God delivered him from what the enemy meant for evil. God truly turned that around for good. Now I quoted that. Those are the words of Joseph in the book of Genesis when he spoke that to his brother. So you, we always need to realize this, that God, God is always going to deliver his people. Sometimes we wonder when, sometimes we wonder how, sometimes we wonder even if. Can I, let me, you know what, let me, let me, let me digress on that just real quick like. If anyone ever, if anyone ever um, rebukes you that you have uh, pertaining to your lack of faith when you question what I just mentioned, if, any, if anyone says, oh, come on, you should never think that way. You know what? You, you, you need to find some other people, though, then in your life who will support you when you do have the whys and the winds and the hows and the ifs, because there's nothing wrong... How, how, how deep can I digress on this? I'm going to take my time on this, okay? Somebody out there needs to hear this. Listen, you don't need Christians in your life who judge you, who judge you the very, very, very few times in your life that when you're going through the most difficult passage in your life that you have questions. There is nothing wrong with having questions. There's nothing wrong with wondering why. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Now, the only time it can get into something wrong with that is when you would abandon your faith, you would abandon God, and you're not going to do that. But there's nothing wrong with asking, why did this happen? I, I, I grew up under this, not, not from my parents, but from other people I would hear from the time I was a boy, is you never question God. Where does it say that in the Bible? You can't find that in the Bible. One thing I've discovered it's healthy. It's beneficial to question God because in conjunction with that, here's what I've discovered. God is big enough to answer all the questions you'll ever ask him. God is well capable and actually he's desirous of answering the questions you have for him. 
especially when you go through things in life and you wonder why and you wonder when, you wonder how, even you wonder if. If you will study your Bible close enough, you will discover some of the greatest men and women he ever used as recorded in the canon of scripture, they had some of those same questions sometimes. It didn't mean, it didn't mean that they limited God necessarily. It didn't mean that they abandoned God. It didn't mean that they forsook God. It didn't mean that they had lack of faith. It just meant sometimes you go through stuff in your life, you would just like to have some answers every now and then. And aren't you glad that God will always, always bring about the answers in our life. And sometimes, sometimes, hear me out on this. Sometimes, you know what the answer is? His act of deliverance. His act of intervening into that given area of your life and delivering you out of the problem, the tumultuous situation you're going through, the complete uh, emotional anarchy that's occurring and raging in your life from the pits of hell. So, so when, 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 when God delivers you from that, there's your answer, okay? So don't, don't, don't beat yourself up over the head that if you've asked those questions in the past or you still ask them from time to time. There again, God is big enough to answer any question you can ever ask him. And also, many times what he will do, he will answer those questions by delivering you out of that given dilemma. So back to this. It's different, though, when you completely limit him. You think that he can't. See, it's different from asking why, asking how, asking when, or even asking if. You know, the, that, there's nothing wrong initially with that whatsoever. But if you let that go to the point that you limit him, that he can't, that he won't, don't ever go to that point because... That's what the enemy wants you to believe. That's what Satan himself wants you to believe. Always remember this. The word of God declares this in the book of Revelation. That Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Now, I know you know this, but let me remind you of this. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, he is our older brother, right? So many times what Satan does, when you go through some of the, some of the darkest place in your life, Satan will start trying to accuse God to you. And if you're not careful, you'll take that bait. I'm sure you haven't. I'm sure you've realized what it was. So don't, don't take that bait. He wants you to take that bait to accuse God that God is the reason why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. That God is the reason why you're going through the, the pain and the suffering in your life. Don't ever, ever, ever accuse God of doing that. God's the only one that can deliver you out of that situation. But basically, that is what happened more than basically, even succinctly, that's what happened. You kind of got the basic category and the succinct category. In Psalm chapter uh, 78, what we read, especially in verse 42, the latter, the, the latter stanza I've been focusing on, is that God's people got to that point, far beyond questioning to the point of accusing God that he, would, that, that, that he didn't care, he's not going to deliver, he's not going to save, he's not going to heal, he's not going to perform miracles any longer. That's a dangerous category. You've never been there and we're never going there. Amen. But out of frustration, out of pain, out of hurt, there again, you read the Bible close enough, you will see that, I mean, Abraham asked questions. Isaac asked questions. Jacob asked questions. Go down the list. You know, uh, Moses asked questions. David asked questions. David, especially when you read all of the book of Psalms attributed to David, which are approximately 73 Psalms attributed directly to David, likely believe that he wrote more than that, but specifically, unequivocally clear, 73 Psalms attributed to David. Many of them were in times of deep distress, times of heartache, times of loss, times of calamity that was occurring, times where he was even questioning himself. He was even questioning God within him even. You know, was he, was, 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 was he even remotely qualified to do what he was doing? And, and, you know, you always need to realize this. God never calls the qualified. He never calls the qualified. He qualifies the call. So David, throughout his life many times, and it wasn't that David was weak in faith, had nothing to do with that. He, he, he had this extraordinary faith. He's listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. It's just that we're all human. We're all human. There's nothing wrong with being human. So when you have a brother or sister in Christ who are experiencing a human moment, anyone out there ever experienced a human moment? 
You don't judge them. You don't condemn them. You don't castigate them. You support, you encourage, and you say, I understand where you're coming from, but always endeavor to tell them this. But listen, God is still the author and the finisher of your faith, and he's going to finish what the devil started. God will finish this thing, and he'll finish it in a good way because our God is a God of deliverance. Amen? Look at this. If you want to uh, go with me over the book of Colossians, powerful scripture here pertaining to deliverance and how, how God works in our life, bringing deliverance into every facet, every season, every setback, every trial in our life. Notice this, the book of Colossians. Uh, wow, well, I can almost start in verse one, but I'm not going to start all the way back there. Let's start. Well, I was going to start in verse 12, but then it's like, well, man, if I, if I want, you know what, we'll start in verse 12. This is the book of Colossians is, of course, all the Paul and epistles just, it, 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 it just this, this, this treasure trove of the depth of God, the nature of God, the nature of Christ, uh, the will of God, uh, the, the attributes of God, and then, of course, flowing in and through his son Christ in, in, into and through the life of every child of God. Let's just start in verse 12, Colossians chapter 1. It says, Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or acceptable, actually they're even qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I said that earlier, almost, almost forgetting what the literal translation, I'm reading from the, from the King James Version, they're getting used to that word meet to be par partakers. It means two things, uh, both helping to define the one thing. It means acceptable, and actually the first definitive word is there, it means qualified. So th this, this is the beauty of this. This is the, this is the beauty of being a child of God, is that, as Paul even makes it very clear, we are accepted in the beloved. So that's why it doesn't matter if people accept you or, or not. It doesn't matter if people reject you. God can't. You're his child. And, and if you, you, you're already accepted in the beloved, therefore it doesn't matter, as David said, it doesn't matter what man can do unto me. It doesn't matter what man says about me. It doesn't matter what they try to do in my life. Doesn't matter if they abandon what it doesn't matter because I'm accepting the beloved. Because you and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, you're a majority. And I'm going to tell you something, when it comes down to it, that's all you need right there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost in your life, and you're going to be fine in Jesus' name. Amen. But there again, uh, that God, we give thanks unto the Father. Here's, here's one of the, the trillions and trillions of reasons why we give thanks unto God. Because he has made us acceptable to be partakers, or he has made us qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. So God has made us qualified. He's qualified us to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we, by, by virtue of Christ, of course, in our life, God made us acceptable, and he's made us qualified, oh, qualified to be a child of God. I know I said that earlier, and there again, at that time, not even thinking about this being connected at all, but, but God, God never calls, calls the qualified. He always qualifies the called. Because when Paul makes it also very clear in the book of 1 Corinthians that not many mighty, not many noble or honorable are called. But God calls the base things of the world. God calls the overlooked. God calls the despised. God calls the rejected. God calls those whose society overlooks. God calls the people that were never picked. God calls the ones that no one ever, ever would have thought it would have been them that God would have used. You ever read your Bible? I mean, just it's replete with people like that. I mean, down, down to David, when Samuel goes to anoint the next king of Israel, you got the seven sons of Jesse in front of him going down to each one. Samuel in his heart, he's saying, oh, surely this is the Lord's anointed. And God said, no, I haven't chosen that one. I haven't chosen him either. Nope, Samuel, you got it wrong again. Nope, all seven. And you, you're saying none of these, Lord? Well, then who? Jesse, you got any more sons? Well, I, I, I have this one. He's the youngest one. And, and he, actually, he's out there. And, and I, I don't want to trail off on the, 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 the theological connective tissue about uh, about David being his eighth son. You probably heard things about that. But anyway, very, very beautiful and powerful. But anyway, then, then he comes in and, 
I mean, he, he's, he, he's in his late teenage years to begin with. Doesn't really look the part. Doesn't look the part. These other guys, I mean, I mean these other guys look like they could, they could be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. David comes in, he's blue collar to the core. It's like, are you sure, Lord? Lord said, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. See, many times the Lord chooses people specifically because they don't look the part. Many times God will choose people because the world never saw any, anything good in them. Many times God will, God will specifically choose someone and use them mightily because the world and many times that individual never thought they would amount to much. Those are the kind of people and also the people who have experienced pain in life, the people who have experienced separation, people who have experienced isolation, People who definitely have pretty much lived their whole life and their thought process in, in complete obscurity. Those are the kind of people that God goes after and chooses and said, yeah, yeah, you're the one. You're the one. Be for those reasons, so many more, and first and foremost, because of their heart. Because the, the ones who seem to have it all together, their heart ain't in the right place. I'm not saying that's always the case, but it is the vast majority of the time. It's the ones who have experienced pain, loss, heartache, hardship. There again, putting their faith and trust in people and being disappointed time and time and time again to where they get to the point, the only one I put my faith and trust in is God. And so from that, God molds them, God shapes them, God uses them, God uses them in a mighty way and God calls them who aren't qualified in the natural sense, who aren't qualified in academia, who aren't qualified in uh, the uh, socioeconomic realm of life. They aren't qualified in so, many, in so many areas, but there again, God sees something that people don't see in them. God calls them, and when he calls them, he qualifies them. And that's why Paul is saying even right here and now, he says, you need to give thanks to God all the days of your life until you make it into heaven because God has qualified you to be partakers of the inheritance of, of the people of God and the inheritance of light, with referring to his kingdom. Of course, you know that God himself, one of his, one of his names is light. So we continue to read. And this is also what God has done for us is why we also thank him. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? We'll come back to that. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I'll just stop right there. Notice this again. Verse 13 puts it in past tense. That God, another reason why we thank him, right, is that, in verse 13, here's the other reason, is that God has, has delivered us from the powers of darkness. Now, some versions, they're going to read from the King James Version, if you notice, deliver us from the power of darkness. Some versions read the kingdom of darkness. Now, both are, are definitely accurate because it actually, the literal translation is somewhat elongated in incorporating both of those word usages is that delivered us, that God has delivered us from the power of the kingdom of darkness. So that's why there again, some Translators just went with power of darkness. Some just went with kingdom of darkness. But it's actually combined there. Delivered us from the powers, and it's plural, from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. Satan's kingdom, they say the satanic realm, which does exist, it is real. Not anything fictitious or mythical about it. Satan is real. His kingdom is real, the kingdom of darkness, the, the, the kingdom of hate, the kingdom of destruction, the kingdom of murder, kingdom of mayhem, the kingdom of, of, of sickness, disease, poverty, every, every, everything that's damaging to humanity, it resides in and is pervaded from the kingdom of darkness. Satan himself being the ruler of that kingdom. But God and God's kingdom and the king of kings, Lord of all lords, Jesus Christ, is his name, is more powerful and mightier than Satan and his kingdom and all the hordes of hell. Never, ever forget that. If I had more time, we'd focus on that, but I gotta keep moving here. 
So when Paul makes it very clear, there again, we're still focusing on the overall topic of deliverance, the delivering power, the delivering aspect of God, is that when Paul made it very clear that God has already, that's why we continue to thank him, right? We start off, here's why you need to thank him, that you're qualified to be part of the people of light, right? The inheritance of light. So we thank you for that. And then now verse 13, here's another reason to thank him, which is an infinite reason, is that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, that God has delivered us. There's that word again, it's delivered. That God has delivered us. That's why I never, ever, ever, ever short or circumvent the delivering power of God. God hath delivered us from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. There again, the kingdom of darkness is that which is, it, 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 it's, the, it's the purveyor, it's the progenitor and purveyor of every diabolical act and deed that you can ever imagine. Everything, I kind of said this earlier, I want to say it a little differently this time. Everything that's destructive, everything that is, is, a, is of a heinous act, it all proceeds from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. Everything. And I don't want to trail off into that because Paul, when he addresses some of that in the book of Ephesians, he said it's even things that should not even be talked about. You know, and, and, and it's not that, oh, you, you can't discuss it and not, and not ever be aware of it. You need to be aware of it because of the reality of the kingdoms of darkness and its power. But at the same time, we don't want to get so focused and fixated on that, that that becomes an obsession more than Christ. I've seen that. I've lived for the Lord several decades now, grew up in church. And one thing I remember, I remember seeing this you know, a couple decades ago is that people just started getting infatuated with, with uh, demonic possession. I mean, you got, you got Christians and you know, just writing volumes and volumes of books about it. And there's nothing wrong with it. I've read them. I've, I've studied I've studied demonology. Uh, I've taught on it uh, to, to bring awareness to the people of God and equip them to overthrow the powers of darkness because we have, that is our God-given covenantal blood-bought right, is to overcome the powers of darkness, the kingdom of darkness. It's the authority of the believer that God has given you through his son, Jesus Christ. And of course, because of Christ, the carries atonement and him defeating Satan and then ascending to God the Father, which he is right now, ever living to make intercession for the people of God right now, according to the book of Hebrews. Um, we have that authority over Satan. It doesn't mean that Satan is not going to mess with us. It doesn't mean that Satan isn't going to try to wreak havoc in our life. He is going to because that's his job. He's, he's going to endeavor to do that all the days of our life. Back to Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Where do those afflictions come from? Not God. They come from Satan himself. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. So now we get into Colossians. We got from that scripture, Psalm 34, Colossians 1.13. We got millenniums that have spanned that distance. And Paul, in some regards, he helps us he helps to exegete how the Lord delivers us. It's because, past tense, God delivered us from the power of darkness. God delivered us from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. When you got born again, when you got, when you got saved, when you became a born again Christian, God not only saved your soul from eternal damnation, eternal torment in hell, but God also gave you, equipped you, covered you, protected you to be delivered from the powers of the kingdom of darkness all the days of your life. Well, pastor, if that's true, then why, why did I experience this, uh, this issue in my life that devastated me? And I know that, that Satan caused that to cause me to go through the pain, my family to go through that pain and the loss and the heartache. Of, well, why that happened? Listen, if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you would have made it through that. You always remember that. So I'm not, I'm not remotely trying, trying to mitigate, I'm not, I'm not remotely trying to minimize the pain that you went through and, and, and the hurt and the loss. 
not trying to, I'm not trying to, there again, minimize it, just trying to erase it and just gloss over. Only you and God knows to the degree that you suffered what you did. But there again, if it had not been God who was on your side, you would have made it through that. So the Lord still delivered you out of that because it didn't take you out. Anything that didn't take you out is a sign that God delivered you from it. I'm going to say that again. Anything you go through in life that devastated, hurt you, it shook you to the core of your being to where you, you, you push pause, not voluntarily, but kind of involuntarily. You push, you push pause on life. And you were just kind of taken out of the game of life, if you will, for some time because it took you a while to get healed back up, to get, to get back in the race, if you will. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't let people judge you over that either. Sometimes, sometimes we, we, we need a little R&R. &R. Sometimes we, we, we need that spiritual ICU in order to get us out of that, that completely devastating situation we went through. And all of that is God's delivering power to get you healed, to get you secure again, and to get you out of that environment. Amen. Never, ever forget that. So if it weren't for God, you, you would have been consumed, as the Bible even said there again, if it hadn't been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be now? So every, every time you come through something, that's a sign that God delivered you from it. Every time you come through something, you come out of something, even though you may come out of it with some scars, some battle scars. Paul had both. Paul had literal scars on his body from the beatings and the scourgings he endured, and also he had metaphorical scars upon him. So he had, he had both, and many Christians have both too. But the thing about it is, you're still going. God delivered you from that which tried to take you out. If it didn't take you out completely, then that means God delivered you from it. Amen? So when you understand that, listen, God has delivered you, past, present, and future, God has delivered you from the powers of darkness. Even though they may assail, God will always cause you to come out victoriously and triumphantly. And there again, back to that. And I know that a lot of times we still may have the questions. And the questions really do nothing more than to set up and to serve God to come into that situation of your life and show you that he is still a God of deliverance. Book of Gideon, I'm going to close on this, going to wrap this up. Just ran through my spirit here. Somebody needs to hear this. I know you're familiar with the account. It begins in the book of Judges, chapter 6. And you begin to find out that God's people, that God's people had been completely subjugated to uh, the Midianites. And actually, actually every, every other heathenistic nation that, that surrounded Israel, they, they, were, they were completely subjected to uh, brutality, uh, just, 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 I mean... If you, if, you, if you can picture being treated less than by someone over you, that's what they were experiencing. To the point, many of them were living in caves. Probably the, actually, most of the Israelites were living in caves in that time because the Midianites completely confiscated and, and commandeered everything they at one time had. So they were living in caves and trying to eke out this meager subsistence and in the midst of all that, you have this, this young man who's, who's, who's hiding out what he's trying to harvest, having to hide that because he doesn't want the Midianites to even come and get what little he does have. Complete abject poverty, right? Fear beyond, I mean, fear that, that, that's palpable when you really read the text close enough. The angel of the Lord appears to him. The first thing he says to Gideon is, thou mighty man of valor. And of course, Gideon starts looking around and saying, what in the world, what are you talking about? Mighty man of valor, I don't, I don't remotely feel mighty. I don't remotely feel anointed. I don't remotely feel uh, like I'm somebody that can go out and conquer anything right now. We've been beat down and beat up so long, we, 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 we can't even believe that things are ever going to even get better. And then, and then he begins to ask the questions. And he, he said, you know, Gideon says, well, well, 
you know, where, where if, if all if all these things have come upon us, you know, where, where is God? Where is God if all of this has happened to us? And there again, remember I said that almost at the outset? There's nothing wrong with asking that. God's big enough to handle those questions. If 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 God is for us, then why why is all this happened to us? You, you know, you know, one of the reasons why it has happened, of course, we understand who it came from, Satan himself, and the powers of darkness. You know, one of, the re- one of the reasons why it's happened is because God is getting ready to show you how big and strong he is in your life. God is getting ready that he allowed the enemy, and that's a mystery within itself, can't go there right now, but God allowed the enemy to mess with you, mess with your family, mess with your people groups, mess with a given nation long enough to where God said, that is enough. I'm going to show you how big I am in your life and in the situation that you're undergoing. I'm going to break those chains that have bound you up. I'm going to liberate the captives. I'm going to bring complete, complete liberty to those who are sitting in every kind of metaphorical prison whatsoever. So when when those things happen in your life, you need to understand one thing. God's getting ready to deliver you. God's getting ready to show you something so great and so big beyond your comprehension, greater than you have ever experienced in your life. Because keep in mind, Colossians 1.13, that's actually past, present, and future. I know it's written in the English language that he has delivered us, but in the tense of the verb there in the Greek language, it's actually perpetual. So it's past, it's present, and it's future. That God, through his son Jesus Christ, has, is, and will deliver us from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. And when, when, when that angel Lord spoke to, unto Gideon, and he began to tell him that God is getting ready to do something in your life that you can't even imagine. And I know you can't see it. You can't see it in yourself. You can't even see it on the horizon. But God is getting ready to perform one of the greatest miracles you and the people of God will ever experience. Because when it's all said and done, we serve the God of deliverance. Father, we thank you, O oh God that you are still designing, you are still orchestrating, Lord. You are still planning the greatest acts of deliverance in the life of your people. Father, I ask right now that you begin to show, begin to show your people like never before, that you are the God of all miracles. You are the God of the breakthrough. You are the God of every form and every level of deliverance, Father. Reveal yourself in a strong and mighty way to your people. I don't know what they're going through, Lord, but you do. You know the details. You know the depth. You know the hurt, the pain, the struggle. You know the setback, God. You know the questions they're asking. And Father, I ask that as only you can, the God of all deliverance, that you come into their life, Lord, and deliver them from this chaotic, hectic, demonic attack that has come upon them for themselves their families, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, their finances, their business, God, their health, their mind, their sanity, Father, whatever it is, bring deliverance now. In Christ's name we pray. And all of God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Hey, listen, you're going to have an incredible, phenomenal week. And God, God is always going to deliver His people. Be strong. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.